the ultimate goal of a dictator is to gain power, and then once you've got power, the goal of the dictator becomes to keep that power. Yeah, you know, it's like you've won a gold medal, but people are wanting to snatch it away from you all the time, so you've got to keep holding on to the gold medal. It, it becomes a vicious circle, because in order to maintain power, you've got to get more powerful as you gain more enemies. And to get more powerful, you've got to restrict people's liberties more. So, in fact, you get worse and worse. Power corrupts, it feeds on itself, and you end up becoming an evil bastard. It's sort of on a par with, you know, dictatorships such as you will see in, in Africa and parts of the Middle East and South America and so on. The Economist Intelligence Unit has a thing they do every year called the Democracy Index, which ranks countries according to their, to their democracy. And it has four categories. It has full democracy, flawed democracy, hybrid regime, and authoritarian regime. Ukraine is 85th and Russia is 124th. And more to the point, Russia is deemed an authoritarian regime. So Russia is right down out of 180 odd countries. Russia is right down in the bottom category in terms of its commitment or otherwise to democracy. These number of rulers are increasing, unfortunately. I mean, the world is moving in that populist authoritarian di direction. Most dictators start off with good intentions. One thinks of Pinochet in Chile or Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore, who they might be brutal, they might want to get rid of their opponents, but at the same time, they have a real sort of modernizing goal for their country. Pinochet sees himself as saving his country from the evils of communism and creating the kind of Chile which can actually uh, pay its way in the world. And so he's really trying to improve the welfare of his citizens. Uh, and of course, Putin, to some extent, starts out in that kind of a way as well. He has a vision of restoring order in Russia and improving the prosperity after the, after the really difficult sort of economic situation in the 1990s. One of the great ironies of communism was that the two sets of people who kept the Soviet Union going, pretty much from the mid-70s onwards, were the KGB themselves, which is why so many KGB officers became very rich after the fall of the Soviet Union, and also um, a network uh, called the Vori, the Thieves-in-Law. And the Vori were, were prisoners. They rejected everything about the Soviet Union, and they, they happily served time. A lot of them had incredibly low hairlines, because they'd had tattoos saying fucked by the party and then had been scalped by the authorities and then, you know, resurmed. They would have tattoos, they would tattoo Lenin and Stalin off their knees so they couldn't be forced to kneel for a firing squad. And this was a sort of incredibly weird and very Soviet alliance of the guys who were supposed to be running, running the show and the guys who rejected everything about the show somehow get together and actually keep the show on the road for 15 years. Communism had failed long before, and so Putin knows that. Putin knows that there's no real appetite to go back to communism. What there is an appetite for is imperialism, is greatness, is pride, is self-respect, and so on. And that's what he's, that's what he's trying to, to re-establish. Are you concerned? No, I'm not concerned. I, I think about uh, the people, ordinary people in Russia. And uh, of course, uh, uh, I see the protest uh, groups and uh, I think about it, what uh, I can to do with uh, all our citizens. Good evening, and we're coming on the air at this hour with breaking news. After the U.S. warned all day of a full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine that it was imminent, Vladimir Putin has just addressed the Russian people moments ago, announcing what Putin called the start of a military special operation, in his words, to demilitarize Ukraine. The problem that all dictatorships have is how to keep on regenerating, reviving their purpose. You come in and you do whatever it was that you, uh, um, that you wanted to to improve things, but then how do you change? 
And that's really the, that's really the difference between a, a dictatorial kind of a regime and a democratic regime. You know, the, the, the great advantage of democracy is that there's a means whereby countries can change peacefully, change without a revolution. But the problem is with dictatorships that there's no kind of internal mechanism for change. So things which might have worked early on work increasingly less well later on. But there's no succession mechanism. There's no way in which, in which the country can change direction without either a palace coup or an assassination or, of course, the dictator dying. For a dictator like Putin, what power means is having the ability to do whatever you feel like, like a kind of medieval king, or indeed, in Russia, of course, a czar, and, and you know, press a button and things just happen. There's no, no, no one argues against you. You have millions of people under your direct control, and they just have to go along with what you are saying. So the hallmarks of your average dictator and all these Putin has in spades are narcissism. You've got to love yourself. Yeah, because you think you're worthy of this power. A ruthlessness, certainly a ruthlessness. You've also got to be very insecure because let's face it, the average person, you know, who actually wants all this power is probably missing something in their psychological makeup. A commitment to power above almost everything else a total mistrust of almost anybody and everything. You've also got to be incredibly selfish. You've also got to try not to care what people think about you, although many dictators do have very thin skins indeed. You've also got to have the most enormous ego um, to be actually believe that you deserve this power. A willingness to go down the sort of personality cult route, especially, that you, and again, you see that with, you saw that with Stalin, you saw that with Hitler, you see that with, with, with Putin, and you certainly see that with the three generations of the Kim family in North Korea, that it's all about the, the person in charge, that the, the office and the incumbent become as one. You've also got to be brilliant at managing the message. That is a very smart way of saying lying all the time to everybody. You've also got to have a lot of people who are loyal to you, who would have helped you on the way up, and you've got to keep them loyal. And also, with those same people, you've also got to divide them. And what you want all those people to be doing beneath you is to be fighting each other rather than fighting you. This is what Putin does. This is what Hitler did. This is what Stalin did. It is dictator textbook tactics. If we look at Russian history over the very long period, what we see is a really peculiar kind of politics to our Western eyes. Historically, Russia's always had a kind of politics which is enormously ruthless, a battle to the death. You know, if you lose power, the consequences are catastrophic. You will certainly end up in prison. You'll probably end up dead. It's not about compromise with your opponent. It's about a battle with your opponent to utterly eliminate them, to make sure that they are no longer any threat. Right from very earliest days, right from the time of Tsar Ivan the Terrible, we see the development of a secret police, which is really operating completely outside of the law, and which is simply the instrument for the preservation of the power of the leader. One of the ways to make your people fearful is to have intelligence and security agencies that spy on your own people. And I think that if you are aware of the fact that you know, one in 100 of you or one in 20 of you is an informer for those agencies, then you're going to have power. Putin was one of those, frankly, slightly strange kids, being no doubt about it. You know, he, he wasn't the kind of, you know, jolly, gregarious, socially confident young man. Uh, this was a young man, a young boy, who actually knocks on the door of his local KGB office in St. Petersburg and says, can I have a job, please? And they say to Putin, you know, you know off you go. And Putin says, OK, well, what shall I go and do? And uh, they say, well, I don't know, go and study law. So dutifully, 
Putin pops around to St. Petersburg University and, and gets himself a law degree. In the Soviet Union at that time, a law degree did not mean that you would go and you know become a, a, a solicitor or a barrister as you would here. I mean, law was fundamentally an arm of the, an arm of the state, a politicized arm of the state. So law was a pretty good introduction into being a KGB agent. Then comes back to the KGB and says, can I join you now? And they go, yeah, all right. They were called the sword and shield of the revolution. You know, they were, they were warriors for and defenders of the system. And he took great pride in that. So I think a combination of, of KGB and Leningrad has really, has really shaped him. But then he goes on to training school, and it's always been his ambition to work uh, abroad, and especially work in the West. This is why he said he wanted to become a KGB agent in the, in the first place. He, he's uh, inspired by this, uh, this film that the KGB had had made in the 1960s called The, the Sword and the Shield. <laughs> Kind of like the um, the Soviet James Bond, the kind of secret agent who's who's placed in Nazi Germany, pretends to be a Nazi officer, and uh, sending all the information back to the Soviet Union and and defending the motherland, as it were. And so Putin says this is why he wants to become a secret uh, policeman. And that's, one person can make so much difference to the glory of the country, as it were. You know, Orwell's view of the thought police was not a million miles away from the, from the Soviet Union. People got, people got taken away for what we would regard as no reason whatsoever. And that had been the case all the way through. Being secretive is, is second nature to Putin, especially as a spy. You know, you give away as little as you have to, and, and even then reluctantly. He was brought up very much within the folds of the system. His, his grandfather had been a cook for both Lenin and Stalin. He catered one of the dachas, the country cottages, which was available for members of the Soviet elite. And so we don't know very much about him, but clearly his grandfather was very much some who was part of the establishment. You know, you would imagine that Lenin and Stalin would have been um, fairly careful about who was cooking their foods. His father had worked for the NKVD, which were the forerunners of the KGB, the secret police. They came after the, the Cheka, and now the KGB are the FSB. Different names, same bunch of guys. During the Second World War, what the Russians called the Great Patriotic War, he was part of the NKVD's destruction battalions, and they were basically responsible for maintaining order, among other things. So they were just as savage towards their own people as they were towards the Nazis. His father was evidently given a mission to locate himself behind enemy lines and disrupt the enemy in whatever ways. So it was a very risky mission and almost a suicide mission. I think only four of the 30 or so in his father's battalion actually ended up surviving. His unit was ambushed and he survives by lying underwater in a bog with a reed sticking out to the wall. I mean, we've no idea whether it's true or whether it's just kind of apocryphal. Well, when we're trying to speculate as to why young Vladimir uh, wants to uh, go and become a secret policeman, certainly uh, his father's wartime history seems to be part of it. But all this period probably taught him that uh, KGB's effectivity is the ideal uh, style system for the Russian bureaucracy. That's why when he put people in places. He always looked for someone he knows from the uh, KGB background or from the intelligence background in, in, the, in the Russian system. His three closest confidants right now, they all date back to the 70s. They all worked with him as KGB agents in Leningrad. So that, you know, that dies hard with, with Putin. He's very much a man of his, of his place and of his time. These people were the ones he relies on. Uh, when he's doing uh, these kind of international interventions in Syria uh, and, and now in Ukraine. He wasn't of the top rank that got given the plum jobs in, you know, in London or Washington or, or Paris, but equally he was, he was senior enough and trusted enough to go abroad. I mean, he wasn't, you know, sent to Irkutsk school, Novosibirsk school, whatever, to, to, to run agents there he, or, to, or to collect information on, on dissidents and so on. He was, he was trusted enough to go to what you might call the near abroad.
Tourists from all over the world arrive in Berlin by bus, car, train, and plane. Walled in, fenced with barbed wire, surrounded by tank traps, barricades, and torn up streets. They were unable to develop computer technology and so on. So the only way to get it was by stealing from the West. He sent agents abroad to try and gather information of technical, you know, computer mainframes, microchips and so on. This is the early days of, of uh, you know, the computer age. They couldn't buy it because there were embargoes and sanctions and so forth. So it seems that one of Putin's roles was to facilitate this. He would be the one who was developing links with Western companies who could be persuaded through financial incentives or, or other kind of uh, secret service operations to uh, pass on technology to the Eastern Bloc that wasn't supposed to be transferred. There was a reasonable amount of, of action in East Germany. It was very much the sort of the jewel in the in the Warsaw Pact crown for the Soviet Union. This is one of the great ironies of the Cold War that that Berlin was this sort of beacon of Western freedom, but in fact the Soviets could have walked in in three hours flat to the western side of it and just taken it over had they ever wanted to and had they ever wanted to risk World War. So Dresden, you know, Dresden was it wasn't it wasn't you know the bright lights and big city, but it wasn't a total backwater either. And that's and that's sort of and that's the slightly the thing about Putin. He was he was good without being great, and therefore you would never have thought, as a young KGB agent, you know, if you if you lined up a lot of KGB agents in the late eighties and said, in ten years' time, one of you guys will be president of of Russia, you, you know, he would not have been the one you'd have chosen, not in the million years. You asked me about 1990 or 91 when I was there. It was a hugely chaotic period economically. I remember there was nothing in the shops. Most of the shops were closed, and every day uh, I was uh, living in a flat in central Moscow. From archives to my flat, I was just walking around, sometimes two hours, just to see who is selling what. Just getting a few things from the street, because people were selling one orange here, a little bit of cheese there, some bread. So it was so chaotic. It was almost like a medieval period. He resigns from the KGB during the coup against Mikhail Gorbachev in August 1991. Gorbachev was on holiday in Crimea, and a bunch of hardliners basically tried to arrest what was the, the, the disintegration of the Union. They did it totally cat handedly Putin gave his loyalty to Anatoly Sobchak, who was his superior in the Leningrad KGB, and Sobchak supported, supported Yeltsin because their view was that Gorbachev was the elected president of the Soviet Union and that any coup against him was unconstitutional. For Putin, the, the system was more important than any one person. He didn't hold with, with this kind of action from the putschists. But actually, there's no evidence that he does resign from the KGB at that time. We certainly haven't got any documents which were like a letter of resignation or anything like that. And there's every reason to suppose, actually, that he doesn't and that he remains intimately connected with the, uh, with the KGB. After the collapse of communism in uh, the Soviet Union in 1991, he gets a job with the new democratically elected mayor in St. Petersburg. And really, um, the, the, the speculation is that the reason that Sobchak gives him a job is that he wants somebody who has KGB connections as his kind of tough guy, as his guy who can actually be the link person with the security services and the link person with organised crime. Yeah basically becomes his bag carrier, but what he's doing is he's forging connections by people, you know, in industry, in politics, you know, all, all around St. Petersburg, 
Putin is the indispensable grey man. You know, he's, he's not you know, making speeches, he's not being a politician. He's simply being a functionary, he's being a bureaucrat. But what Putin knows, and what people often know, is it the people at the nexus of power, it's people in the marge, it's people, you know, at the meeting points of power, are the people who actually gain the power, because they're the people who knows you know, what different people want, and they can manage those relationships. And suddenly, Putin finds himself you know, at the heart of the heart of power in St. Petersburg. He finds himself enriching himself because everything is corrupt. So that is a key part of the Putin narrative, that relationship with subject. All those pictures of those guys, he's never, you know, he's always the one in the corner at the back, but he's always obviously by the same token watching and absorbing information. And, you know, that sort of, he is the, he is the gray man and, and yet, he was the one who succeeded because obviously he was very smart about where to position himself and whose and who's coattails to follow. And Sobchak was a very good guy to hitch his star to. Loyalty is something that he he was proud of in himself and values in other people. When, when Sobchak wasn't re-elected in, in 1996, Putin was offered a job by a successor and, refu and refused, saying, I'd rather be hanged for loyalty than rewarded for betrayal, which is slightly melodramatic for, for, for a government job, but I think it's also quite revealing. That, and that, again, that comes into the fact that he trusts his old KGB mates from the 70s. Loyalty is a very big thing for him. As time's gone on, it's become, uh, I think, increasingly convincing to say that, that really what's going on in St. Petersburg in the 1990s is rather different to what's going on in Moscow. In Moscow, President Yeltsin is trying to turn Russia into a democracy and not succeeding very well. But really, in St. Petersburg, the KGB remain in charge. What we see when Putin moves from from St. Petersburg to Moscow and then moves into the presidency is, it's like the KGB reasserting themselves and, and the KGB really regaining control. Russia in the 1990s under Boris Yeltsin was certainly a very chaotic environment. Yeltsin and his government have been trying to create a market economy. Rather than creating a market economy, what they've done is that they've transferred ownership in the most important bits of the Russian economy to a small number of individuals who've become mega rich. Russia's much more stable now. I mean, that, I mean, that, that, that pace of change was unsustainable. And it, it, was only, it only happened because you'd gone from an incredibly restricted system to something where, you know, certainly in economic terms, all bets were off. There's no legal system worth the name. Any country's stability is based fundamentally around the rule of law. You know, you can talk about political diversity and, and political plurality and, and so on. But without a rule of law that is basically efficient and impartial, nothing happens. And in Russia at that time, there was no rule of law. If you had a disagreement with someone, you sorted it out with violence. Because there was no, you know, you couldn't have a business dispute and take it to the court. There were no, there were no courts. There was a ton of money floating around and the money was getting bigger, you know, especially because with the economic reforms, the exchange rates on the uh, international market, the disparity was so huge. The, you know, you could, you could buy a barrel of oil for next to nothing in rubles and sell it for a fortune in dollars. They called it the Wild East. Anything went. They, there's a word for them, they're called dorkadents. They were decadent dorks. They were, they were the kind of dorks who back, back home would never have, you know, got anywhere. But here they were sort of, you know, they're walking, driving around in limousines and beautiful women and, you know, champagne and so on. Just because it was, just because they, they it was that time and place where they where they could and it was yeah it was it was anarchy the memories of that time really die hard for lots of russians and actually for a lot of russians given them the choice between authoritarianism and and the anarchy of the yeltsin years they'll take authoritarianism they'll say you know we don't really we don't want that anymore you know freedom freedom 
in a pretty nebulous concept when, when there's anarchy around. At the start of the year, his approval rating was something like 5%. And Gennady Zyuganov, who was the communist candidate, was going to win. And fundamentally, that would have been a, a slide back into communism. After four years of, of the Soviet Union being over, everyone would be going back to where they'd been. And a group of seven oligarchs clubbed together and basically bought the election for Yeltsin. And they funneled hundreds of millions of, of dollars into his campaign. I mean, way more than was allowed. And they bought the election, and it, and it worked. The FSB is the successor to the KGB. It's a very notorious state intelligence agency. And Putin ends up being nominated and becoming head of the FSB. This is an extraordinary leap from what was effectively a very sort of low-grade employee in Dresden in the 80s. And then suddenly to become head of the successor organization is, is, is a huge coup for Putin. And what's interesting in the 1990s is that Yeltsin says he's committed to democracy and to democratization, but he never really reforms the security services. They remain in pretty much the same kind of organization that they were in the Soviet times, a tool which is there for the state to use to do its dirty work. There's two intelligence services in Russia, two main intelligence services, the FSB, who are domestic intelligence, and the SVR, who are foreign intelligence. It's pretty much the same as MI5 and MI6 here, or as the FBI and the CIA in America. So as, as head of the FSB, he would have been responsible for internal Russian espionage. He was Russia's top internal spy. So really, when Putin becomes head of the FSB, becomes head of this organization that's still able to exercise I wouldn't say total power, but an enormous amount of power within the country without any kind of accountability or scrutiny. People who get that job know where the bodies are buried. It's a circle. You get that job because you know those things, and having that job gives you access to more of the same. It's an enormously important sort of political base for him. The FSB's headquarters are uh, the Lubyanka in Moscow, and the Lubyanka is big um, brown building in the center of Moscow. I've walked past it, and you know, perhaps it's sort of suggestiveness because you know what it represents. But there is definitely a shudder as you walk past it. You know, people go into the Lubyanka and they, and it, historically, and they never came out. You keep tabs on people. So it's, it's that kind of attitude that citizens are suspect. When I see Putin, because I studied Soviet history, I see, uh, two other Soviet leaders, uh, Stalin and Andropov. The most significant aspect of Stalin's personality is his insecurity and seeing enemies everywhere. I mean, he didn't trust more than a handful of individuals. Uh, Andropov was like that. Uh, Andropov was the longest serving head of KGB and Putin is very similar. This line explains quite a lot. If we talk a little bit more about, for instance, Andropov, Putin never hides his admiration for Andropov. One of the first things he did when he was appointed as the prime minister by Yeltsin, he went to Lyubliyanka, the building where the FSB was centered in, in Moscow, and he opened a memorial for Andropov. And Andropov was a very interesting personality, even though many historians didn't write about him because he stayed in power for a very short period as the president because of his health. But when Andropov came to power, what he tried to do was very similar to what Putin did after uh, 2000. After Brezhnev in 1984, one of the first things is he just said, I don't trust the bureaucracy. The Soviet bureaucracy was so uh, archaic, uh, there, there is laziness everywhere. So he said, I want to bring order and discipline. And this order and discipline also were Putin's uh, ideas when he became the president. 
And for instance, one of the strangest things happened in the Soviet history. There is an operation, intelligence gathering operation called Operation Ryan. Uh, this o o Operation Ryan is the largest ever intelligence gathering operation in the world. But if you look at the details, there was no reason for this. Andropov wanted to use this Operation Ryan to shake the whole Soviet bureaucracy. He prepared detailed questionnaire and so many tasks and sent this to every single institution within and outside of the Soviet Union. Embassies, uh, di diplomatic centers, everywhere. And asked them to collect information because he said, I have reliable information that Western powers are getting ready to attack Soviet Union by nuclear power. And said, collect this information, this will help us to prepare ourselves. But the information was ridiculous. For instance, some of the information sent to the Russian embassy in London was saying that, ask uh, your contacts in the other parts of the UK how much milk you consume this week how much blood, blood donations were, were made, price of bread, the price of essential items. He was asking all these things to be collected. So creating the impression that if we can see some kind of a change in these essential aspects, for instance, more blood donations suddenly happened in one week, then we can consider this get, getting ready for a nuclear war. So th this is, for instance, a, an example, uh, his suspicion, his personality, and his, he only re relied on intelligence people coming from intelligence background. Uh, Putin is, is more or less the same. There's an interesting story about how Putin first gets to be prime minister. He's appointed prime minister by Boris Yeltsin at the end of the 1990s. This, this is really important because Yeltsin is looking for the right successor. Yeltsin is very anxious about leaving office because if he leaves office, he's very worried that people will want to get revenge for various things that happened. What Yeltsin wants is a peaceful retirement. And in order to get a peaceful retirement, he needs to hand over power to somebody who he trusts. And why does he end up settling on Putin? Answer, because Putin manages to deal with a corruption scandal that's very greatly bothering Yeltsin and deal with it in an extremely efficient and ruthless way. This is the so-called Mabitex affair. Russian newspapers publish details of a project to refurbish the Kremlin which has been given to a Swiss-owned firm, which is, which is owned by a rather dodgy Albanian businessman. And they also publish credit card statements from Yeltsin's daughters, which show that the company which has been given the uh, contract to refurbish the Kremlin has paid hundreds of thousands of dollars onto the credit cards of Yeltsin's daughters and the, the, the Russian Prosecutor General announces an investigation into this. So in other words, the clouds of corruption are surrounding Yeltsin. Now Putin at this time is head of the FSB. He decides that uh, he is going to deal with this in the most kind of ruthless, typical KGB style. Film is released and shown on the Russian evening news of the prosecutor general who's investigating the Yeltsin family romping on a bed and in a sauna with two prostitutes. And so, of course, the, pub, the prosecutor general is humiliated and has to resign and the story goes away. And so Yeltsin is said to be extremely impressed with how, how well Putin deals with that. He's, this is the kind of ruthlessness that a leader of Russia needs. And that's the point at which Yeltsin makes Putin prime minister. Now, he's prime minister, but no one's heard of him. Uh, yeah, I, think, I think his poll rating at the time is 2% in the opinion polls. Um, Yeltsin's is about 3 or 4%. Yeltsin is universally hated by this time. 
So how are they going to turn Putin from 2% in the polls to a credible presidential candidate who can beat the then favourite for the presidency, who's a real enemy of Yeltsin's, who Yeltsin thinks will be returning com Russia to the communist past? And how do you do this? Well, you fight a short, victorious war. But Russia isn't at war with anybody, so there's a need to manufacture a war in order to turn Putin into a kind of war leader. First of all, there's an explosion in a Moscow shopping mall, and then a truck bomb blows up outside an army barracks in the Southern Republic of Dagestan. And then there are three so-called apartment bombings where Apartment blocks are blown up in the middle of the night. Something like 300 Russian citizens, civilians were killed in those bombings. And immediately the authorities said they were Chechens. Even before anyone came and in did investigation in the place, they said Chechen, Chechens did this, Chechen terrorists did this. And, and, and Putin's response was immediately send the army to Chechnya. As of now, Putin's rating is zero. Uh, he was never regarded as a serious presidential contender, and I don't think that Yeltsin's approval will add much uh, to that zero. And Putin makes these speeches saying, I will wipe out the terrorists wherever they are, I will find them. If they're in the outhouse, I will rub them out in the outhouse. He's using real kind of mafia slang. He's going to be the big dog who can, who can keep the country safe from these terrorists who are just slaughtering ordinary people. So suddenly, his poll ratings start shooting up. Now, the interesting thing about the apartment bombings is that there's an awful lot of evidence that these were not, in fact, carried out by Chechen terrorists, that, in fact, the apartment bombings were a false flag operation by the FSB. For example, the expertise to, to blow up buildings in the very precise way that it was done. Um, the explosive which was used to do them, which was only available to, 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 to the Russian state. There was a, a failed bombing in the city of Ryazan. The, the, the people who planted the explosives were actually caught and turned out to be FSB agents. And then the head of the FSB comes out and says, well, no, that wasn't, a, that wasn't an attempted bombing at all. That was a training exercise by the FSB. So really, uh, one might say that this is the kind of founding crime of the Putin regime, that actually Putin was prepared from the start to see hundreds of his own people blown up in order to secure his political power. Chechen war occupied Russian mentality, Russian culture so significantly, and there was a background to this. It's not only in the post-Cold War period. I think if you look at the Russian history, from Tsarist period uh, to the Soviet period to the post-Soviet period, Chechnya, even such a small uh, area uh, in, in terms of geography, very small population, but Chechnya was very symbolically important for Russians to control. Any novel you read, there was some re -re reference to Chechnya. They were presenting Chechens like some kind of a primitive creatures, very brave, uh, fearless, but almost like uh, they are not human. Uh, they are different kind of people. Therefore, capturing Chechnya, controlling Chechnya, was an element of strong Russian personality. Taking the capital is, is, is almost sort of medieval in, in the way in which you, you fight war. And all it's going to do is, is put more people out of their homes. It's not actually going to destroy the fighters. It is symbolic for the people back in Russia, um, back in Moscow and in the major cities in the east. But it is, it, it's, it's nothing, uh, literally nothing, to do with, with, with winning the war. In 1998, the ruble was devalued. Come 1999, when Putin becomes prime minister and then becomes president on, on Millennium Eve, this is a country that has basically undergone a roller coaster for eight years. Business disputes were, were, were solved by, by executions. 
Um, you know, people, and people got shot in five-star hotels in the, middle of the, in the middle of the day. You've got to remember, when the Soviet Union collapsed, you know, at the beginning of the 90s, Putin was an almost kind of pensioned-off junior nobody in the KGB, who, who had had a very unspectacular career. And yet, by the beginning of the 90s through to 2000, Putin then takes control of Russia. So ultimately, it takes less than a decade for this relative nobody to become one of the most powerful people in the world. How are you going to show that those fears are misplaced and assure people that the hard-won freedoms in Russia are now secure? And I want to underline yet again that the actions of Russia are not against, against Muslims, against Chechens. They are directed entirely against international extremism and terrorism, and which have a global character. Ruthlessness and lack of compassion, I suppose, is a, is a fairly useful quality in a dictator. You know, we, we see throughout Putin's uh, presidency a sort of utter indifference to the value of human life. If it's a choice between in human life uh, and his power. He's always consistently chosen his power. There was no doubt that before Putin came to power, Russia was, you know, in a pretty chaotic state. You have Yeltsin, a, a, a basically a, a, a barely functioning alcoholic, notionally in charge. You have those original oligarchs, those very rich men were basically plundering Russia for its wealth. People were, of course, still licking their wounds. The Soviet Union had only collapsed a few years before, and so national prestige had been massively dented. So you've got there, you know, just a few of the elements and a very noxious cocktail that Putin can turn around and go, I can make all this better. Yeltsin resigns as president on typical Yeltsin dramatic fashion. He resigns on New Year's Eve of 1999, there's the start of the new millennium, Putin becomes acting president. So the first decree he signs is to give Yeltsin and his family perpetual immunity from prosecution, and not just immunity from prosecution, but the immunity from search, seizure, anything. So it's quite interesting that politically, isn't it? Because it's basically saying that politicians are not accountable for their actions. It's really, I, I suppose, sending a signal that the state is going to do what it wants and it's not going to accept any kind of accountability. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. The first thing he does is to make sure that he gets control of the media. This is absolutely the core of the creation of the Putin system. So under Yeltsin, there'd been independent media. It wasn't necessarily a kind of broad spectrum, but there were certainly television stations that were enormously critical of the Russian government. And Yeltsin was perfectly happy to allow that. Yeltsin didn't mind criticism. Uh, Putin isn't having any of it. He wants to absolutely control the agenda. It's said that his predecessor, President Boris Yeltsin, the only thing that he had on his desk was a pen, which he used to sign presidential decrees. And when Putin takes over from Yeltsin, the pen gets replaced by a remote control because he's so obsessed with uh, his image on television. And, uh, and various people who met him early in his uh, presidency say sometimes he, he used to uh, stop the meetings to turn on the news to see how he's being reported. You hold on to power as a dictator by getting increasingly ruthless. You also hold on to power by making sure uh, that you control the message. You've got to keep lying. Lie, 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 lie. So you've got to keep your people in the dark. And that's how you keep power. If we go back to the Soviet Union, really propaganda is the attempt to persuade people that reality is something other than it is. Soviet propaganda was, was constantly saying how life is much better in the Soviet Union, how people are starving in the outside world, the West is corrupt, and there's no truth to it, but say it enough and force people to repeat it. 
But Putin era propaganda is very different. It's no longer trying to convince people of an ideology. It's no longer trying to convince people that communism is the best kind of system. Actually, Putinist propaganda isn't trying to convince people of anything. It's just trying to confuse. What Putin wants is for people not to know what's real. Now, in cities with a, with a younger population, a more liberal population, a more tech-savvy population, there's ways around that. There, there's YouTube, there's social media, and so on. But they are also a minority of the population. The vast majority of Russia's population live in the countryside and get their news entirely from state media. But as we know, these kind of conditions, uh, it is not always very easy. I mean, Russia is a very big country, huge number of people, and uh, people living in the villages, in the provinces, they are more traditional and they are more open to official propaganda. So change comes much, much more slowly. In a free press, People in the West can see alternative narratives and decide for themselves which one they want to believe. In Russia, you don't get that. You get one, you get one narrative that you are presented with as fact. When Putin came to power, uh, some of the news organizations were actually owned by oligarchs. And, and sometimes these oligarchs could be critical of Putin, and that would obviously be very annoying for Putin. So what does he do? He wrestles back control of those media networks from the oligarchs, and that means that he's in charge of his own message. You see that with, with Hitler's Germany. Was there any kind of publication or, 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 or media agency of the time ultimately not subject to Nazi control? No, none. So a lot is made about, you know, dictatorships being propaganda geniuses. Well, it's not that hard to manipulate the message if you can control every newspaper, every magazine, every TV station, you know, every, every cinema, you name it. Forget it, it's easy. So that's the first point, control over the media. The next thing that you do is that you eliminate other political opponents. How do you eliminate uh, independent political parties? Answer by running very unfree elections. You make sure that there's only favourable coverage for the, for the parties that you approve of, uh, whereas the parties who are critical of Putin very quickly find their life is made very difficult. They, uh, they're starved of airtime in the media, they're, you know, they, they turn up to, the, to campaign events to find that, uh, I'm sorry, the hall is flooded, you can't speak. The people who are sponsoring them are pressured to stop sponsoring them. And also, you, manip you, you manipulate their ability to actually run for office as well. In this way, basically, Putin ends up eliminating all of the true opposition parties within Russia. And we end up with a parliament which is still a multi-party parliament, but basically all of the parties in the parliament end up agreeing with the Putin government line. Around Yeltsin was this group called The Family, which is sort of half mafia and half Charles Manson. They weren't really an actual family. The only one who was, who was an actual blood relative was his daughter Tatiana. But it was, you know, it was some of the oligarchs. It was a guy called Anatoly Chubais who was Minister for Economic Reform and, and, and in charge of privatization. A lot of these guys had got fabulously rich on, on the back of their proximity to power. Essentially, what's happened is that the state has sold them assets at massively reduced prices. As soon as these assets go onto the open market, especially the oil industry, it suddenly they're, they're worth 8, 10, 12 times what the, uh, what the oligarchs have paid for them. So, in other words, the 1990s has been a process where the state has been appointing its own billionaires. He got the oligarchs together and he said fundamentally, right, you stay out of my face and I'll stay out of yours. So you don't get involved in politics, you know, preferably you go abroad. Berezovsky and Abramovich came to London. The only one who really stayed behind and challenged him was a guy called Mikhail Kolikovsky. And the key point in terms of taking down the Yeltsin era oligarchs is the so-called Yukos affair. 
So Yukos is the oil company which is owned by a man called Mikhail Khodorkovsky. And Khodorkovsky is Russia's richest man. He has created this oil company, Yukos, and he's, and, and he's, he's kind of tried to uh, portray it as this kind of kind of flagship company which is introducing Western accounting standards and transparency and is run in a much more efficient way. Putin is persuaded that even though Khodorkovsky is the richest man in Russia, he really has to take him down. To cut a long story short, Khodorkovsky is arrested, uh, he's thrown into prison, He's accused of various kinds of uh, highly trumped up charges. Really, he's accused of stealing from his own company and he's accused of not paying taxes. And he's sentenced to eight years. I mean, to see the fourth richest man in the world standing in a cage not much bigger than the chair I'm sitting on is an extraordinary turnaround. And it shows you that, you know, it was, you know, the oligarchs that got Putin into power but it's now Putin who keeps the oligarchs where he wants them. It's very clear, and it was very clear to everybody at the time, that these charges were made up. That Khodorkovsky well, he might have been guilty of many things, but he certainly hadn't been stealing from his own business. But that wasn't the point. The point was to send a signal, to send a signal to the other oligarchs that if you challenge me, and if you challenge me politically, you will lose everything that you have. Arrest of Platon, that I will be the next one. And I was given the opportunity to fly to the border, but I came back, understanding о том, что предстоит, так сказать, попасть в тюрьму. Я считал, что я должен отстаивать свою позицию, свою правоту в суде. Видимо, в том числе и из-за несколько наивного представления о правосудии. That was Putin's MO, was to fundamentally say, okay, you can keep what you have, but you, you know, you leave me alone and gradually he moved his own, his own guys in. So again, you know, the same pattern, different personnel. Знаете, есть такая поговорка, что умный человек находит выход из ситуации, а мудрый в неё не попадает. Ну, возможно, я был недостаточно мудрым. Really what this is is a new deal with Russia's business elites. They're no longer a sort of independent power. They're now a power that is holding their wealth thanks to the goodwill of the leader. I mean, it's a very Russian way of dealing, of dealing with things because this is, this is the thing, there's no, genuine, there's no genuine opposition in Russia. So it's a kind of political structure that, that promotes mediocrity. You know, if there's anyone who stands out, then they're a potential threat. So again, there's this kind of internal mechanism inside dictatorships whereby, whereby talented people do not thrive. It's always hard, especially with hindsight, because as a Western leader, you have to, you have to try and build bridges. It's very easy when you're in opposition or when you're a journalist or when you're a voter to say, oh, these people are scum, you shouldn't deal with them, or whatever. As a leader, you are responsible not only for the basics of international diplomacy, but also for trade. And on a slight tangent, I remember Barack Obama saying in 2016, and someone asked him about, you know, Trump transferring his business acumen to government. And Obama said, listen, running a business is, is complex, but fundamentally, it's also quite simple. You have to maximize revenue for shareholders and you have to stay within the law. As a, pre as a, as a president, as a political leader, you have to balance a hundred different things and there's no actual value on lots of them, tangible value. You have to, you have, you know, you have endless people who want a piece of it, who feel entitled to a piece of it, and there's no right answer. So I don't blame Bush and Blair for trying to forge good relations with Putin. Had it worked, we wouldn't be where we are now.
but to an extent I would say that the opposite was true in some ways I think that you know you can make a good argument that Obama saying that if chemical weapons are used in Syria that would change my calculus and chemical weapons were used and it didn't change his calculus and that was you know that was a red line crossed and any politician knows the basis that if you threaten something you have to be prepared to carry it out and especially to someone like Putin on the on the other end of that that's like blood to a shark you can't threaten to do something and then not do it so trying to be friends with Putin in the broad sense of the word trying to co-opt him I don't think was a, was a bad thing letting him get away with things was a bit was a much bigger mistake before I proceed to the formal part I would like to express to Her Majesty the Queen and the people of the United Kingdom our sincere condolences with the loss of the British soldiers in Iraq. It is clear for everyone that in spite of the differences that existed before, today we need to act jointly. My message to you, Mr. President, is therefore one of admiration, respect and support. I wish both you and Mrs. Potina a most successful and enjoyable visit to this country. May I now ask all our guests to raise their glasses and drink a toast. His Excellency the President of the Russian Federation and the Russian people. Putin's relationship with the West has, has, has changed and evolved over two decades. You know, it started off as, as kind of hands being held out, shaken. George Bush saying, I've looked into this man's soul and he's a good guy. You know, Blair, Tony Blair, Prime Minister of, of the United Kingdom, saying, you know, he's a man we can do business with, he's all right. Putin courted people like Blair and Bush at the beginning of his own presidency through invasion, through murder, through gangsterism, through theft, through terror the West has finally realised that Putin is the world's latest Hitler. For a long time, the West have had this belief, you know, that Putin is a man they can do business with. And this goes back to, you know, to Mrs. Thatcher saying, President Gorbachev's a man I can do business with. And, and every Western leader likes to think that they'll be the ones to sort of bring Russia into the fold. And it never fully happens because the Russians just don't think that way. And I think when, when they do try and call it out, it sort of causes so much diplomatic eruptions. And you see this now with, with Biden fundamentally calling Putin a war criminal, and then the State Department start rowing back on the statement. There's sort of diplomatic protocols and there's diplomatic precedents and, and so on. But yes, and there's also, there's also the question of the UN Security Council. That, you know, there are five permanent members of the UN Security Council of which Russia and China are two. And so there is, there is an element to which everyone wants to try and play nicely, you know, even if only for the cameras. Why do we think that we can trust uh, the leader of, leaders of Saudi Arabia? It is the same thing. I think it is the, uh, the global economy uh, and, and countries rely on each other. And Russia uh, was and is a very important country in terms of uh, our economic uh, conditions. Uh, majority of the Europe depend on R R Russian energy. So what matters to many gl global leaders was more than democracy, was uh, stability and uh, uh, continuity.
The Russian prosecutor general briefed a very sober-looking Vladimir Putin in the Kremlin this morning on the latest findings and theories. The head of the gang, he said, shot one of the gunmen and later detonated explosive belts on two of the women by remote control. It was all about intimidating hostages and hostage takers alike, he said. This morning, President Putin made an unannounced visit to both hospital and school. Solemn-faced, he toured the wards, offering somewhat awkward comfort. One little girl, oblivious. As time has gone on, uh, and, he's, and he's concentrated power more and more in his hands, and he's eliminated the independent media, and he's emasculated the parliament, and he's destroyed all of the opposition, that he's found himself in a situation where he's surrounded by this kind of set of cronies who are praising him and uh, telling him what a great leader he is and telling him how he's restored Russia's greatness. And this seems to have gone to his head. So his self-image now seems to be very different to what it was early in his presidency. He now seems to see himself as the kind of philosopher king who the, the whole future, the whole safety of Russia depends on him and him alone. Russia has, has got this, this thing about being a great power. This dates back to, you know, to the end of the Cold War, and it's quite hard, I think, for lots of people in the West to understand how humiliating that loss for, for Russia was, because firstly, they'd lost the Cold War without a shot being fired. Secondly, they went through, I think, probably the greatest single transformation of any country that hasn't lost an actual physical war. That they went from, from, from empire to country, from superpower to non-superpower, from 15 countries to, to one, and from communism to capitalism all in one go. And it was incredibly disorientating, especially to someone like Putin, who, you know, who, who had dedicated his life and his values to, to maintaining an emp to, uh, you know, the Soviet Union that no longer existed. Um, and ever since then, I think he has, you know, he has feared the, the people who beat him, and he has wanted to, to, to get back some sense of, of Russian pride in, in the world. And that is incompatible with an ever-expanding NATO. Today we are witnessing an almost uncontained hyper-use of force, military force, in international relations. Force that is plunging the world into an abyss of permanent conflicts. We are seeing a greater and greater disdain for the basic principles of international law. And independent legal norms are, as a matter of fact, coming increasingly closer to one state's legal system. One state, and of course, first and foremost, the United States, has overstepped its national borders in every way. This is the point at which it's clear that Putin doesn't want to cooperate with the West anymore. He, he denounces the United States, only acting in its own interests. Uh, it's hostile to Russia. It wants to split it up. It wants to uh, steal its natural resources. The United States wants to run the world. So really, the, 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 this, is, this is the break any kind of a sense that Russia should become a sort of ordinary part of the international community. This is where Putin is saying, we are going to do our own thing, we are going to challenge American dominance. It turns out that NATO has put its frontline forces on our borders. And we continue to strictly fulfil the treaty obligations. Do not react to these actions at all. I think it is obvious that NATO expansion does not have any relation with the modernization of the alliance itself or with the ensuring security in Europe. On the contrary, it represents a serious provocation that reduces the level of mutual trust. And we have the right to ask, against whom is this expansion intended? He now wants to construct a narrative of there's an enemy out there that is trying to undermine us. So that's why the Munich speech is so important, because this is where this becomes obvious to the world that uh, Ru Russia is no longer a reliable partner. The NATO thing is interesting because there's a, he uses this, the, this explanation that in 1990, um, pledges were given by James Baker who was then the US Secretary of State, to Mikhail Gorbachev, 
that after the fall of the, the after the fall of the Soviet Union, it, were it to come to pass, which it did, the following year, NATO would not expand eastwards. There is relatively little evidence that Baker ever made such a claim, and if he did make such a claim, it was pretty much confined to to Germany. It was basically in in, in exchange for um, Russia accepting the reunification of Germany. Certainly, there is no written there's no written treaty. Gorbachev himself in 2014 denied that such a conversation had ever taken place. And even if it had done, you could argue why should a conversation between two men who haven't been in power for 30 years be forever binding on, on their successors? His problem with, with NATO is that he thinks that NATO is an aggressive power. And whereas NATO regards itself as a defensive power. And so, you know, this is why he has this sort of fundamental issue with former Soviet republics turning to NATO, turning to the West, because he sees it as, as the world against him. I think another really important hallmark of any dictator is that they become increasingly paranoid. They think the world's against them. And then they act in that way, and then, of course, ultimately, the world then does have to turn against them. And the irony is that his big political hero, Peter the Great, actually looked to the West. You know, Peter, the, one of the reasons that the Russian flag is the same tricolor as the Dutch flag is how much Peter admired Dutch shipbuilders back in the 17th century and actually looked towards the West. One of the significant references in terms of Putin's ideology is Izborsky Club. Putin's ideas were influenced by this group's ideas because this group included people who write, who were philosophers, writers, newspaper columnists. But Putin also is very clever. He never committed himself fully into this group because he considered also some of the ideas of this group can be seen too extreme. The name comes from the name of a city, Izborsk, in the northwestern part of Russia. And this city has some uh, symbolic significance for the Russian history, especially Eurasianists. In the 13th century, German knights tried to capture uh, that area, and the, the Russian soldiers defended that area successfully. And this became a symbol of defending Western uh, influences, Western attacks. A group of individuals came in that uh, town in 2012 and established a club, a, a kind of think tank. And their main idea since then to influence the political structure, the politicians, that Russia should move into a much greater position in the global system. And one of the key names is Prekhanov. Prekhanov is the owner of the newspaper Zavtra. It is a conservative uh, Russian patriotic newspaper. And another one is Dugin, Alexander Dugin. Uh, Alexander Dugin is very well known both in Russia and abroad. And he's the one of the uh, creator of the current uh, modern day uh, Eurasianism. And according to many interpretations, he is behind this uh, Crimean and uh, Eastern Ukraine operations, and also he he's behind that idea that Ukraine is not an independent nation and it should be part of Russia. Every time when he feels that their ideas or their extreme position starts harming his image, he drops them. Dugin's ideas, probably more than anybody else, is influencing the whole Russian foreign policy. He wrote a book called Fundamentals of Geopolitics, which is one of the key books to understand, to analyze the Eurasianism currently, what Russia is trying to do, what Russia sees itself in a future world. Like Eurasia being the mainland in the whole earth and the most important land, uh, as you, you may know, Eurasia has more than 70% of the global energy resources. Around 70% of the people live in Eurasia. So therefore, even if China is the biggest power in Eurasia, R Russia still wants to be the leading power, at least in terms of security, because of his military and nuclear arsenal. 
so I think because of these kind of reasons, Eurasianism is very important to Putin, even though he doesn't use the term too often. He doesn't want to be seen as a Eurasianist, but Eurasianist ideas kind of shapes his all uh, overall worldview and his his his, his project. For instance, during 2016, there was a coup attempt in Turkey. And the Turkish government blamed the Western powers, especially the United States, behind the coup attempt. Dugin, at that point, was one of Putin's advisors. He was visiting Ankara. Dugin was the person who told the Turkish government, who passed the plans of the uh, coup plotters. And after that, the relations between Russia and Turkey became much closer. So Dugin is the kind of strategist as well, kind of trying to expand the Russian links and Russian influence in the region of Eurasia. These Russian neocons are individually influential people. Other members as well, for instance, there is one of the founding members is Bishop Tikon. Bishop Tikhon is a well-known Orthodox priest, and according to some speculations, he was Putin's confessor. So Putin from time to time confesses to him, even though we have no direct evidence, but people write about that. This group, for instance, in 2014, when Crimea was annexed, more than 20 leading members of this group, they met in a, a palace in Crimean Peninsula called Livania Palace. And this palace was significant. Most of the Tsarist period's leaders, they used this palace as their summer residence, but also Yalta Conference took place in this palace, and Yalta Conference was considered a significant turning point for the Soviet Union uh, after Yalta. All Eastern Europe came under the Soviet control, and they celebrated uh, the return of Crimea into Russia. Спасибо вам за поддержку. Да здравствует Россия! Since then, they established more than 20 branches in the other parts of uh, Russia, also one branch in Ukraine, in Donbass. And in the opening event of this uh, Ukrainian branch, there were uh, many delegates, from even from Kiev, uh, from various parts of uh, Ukraine. Uh, so this group is not just a one single official building in the center of uh, Moscow. It has also branches all over uh, Russia and a branch uh, in Ukraine. So they are sh kind of shaping the public opinion. And through them, I think uh, Putin also uh, sending his, his messages to unofficially. <laughs> Putin disdains what he would regard as sort of wokeism, liberalism, freedom. You know, he is socially extraordinarily conservative. So, you know, he, he doesn't like gay people. You know, he doesn't like you know, anybody who you know, deviates from what he sees as a kind of heterosexual norm. Hates the fact that former countries that are in the Soviet Union or behind the Iron Curtain want to become westernized and, and not russified you know he hates the fact that a big mac is more seductive than anything putin offers that's the problem with people of putin's generation often in russia uh, you know people from his sort of political background is they loathe the fact that the soviet union was a failure and the fact that actually ultimately american style capitalism and european style liberalism won the day Clearly, at this point, he makes a judgment that 
it's too dangerous to retire. You know, if you like, he's got too much blood on his hands by this time. So he's got to find a way to maintain control over the reins of power, even from outside of the presidency. In, in 2007, Putin realized he was coming to the end of his second term as president. The Russian constitution said you can only do two terms. Uh, so he knew that he had to step aside. Now, it is arguable as to whether he could have changed the law to enable him to serve another term or indefinite numbers of terms. Some people think he could, some people think he don't. I don't have an opinion. Um, what's key is, though, what he did do was obey the constitution. So it showed a message to the West, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not breaking my own rules here. Various people are considered as a replacement, and eventually he settles on uh, one of his close associates who he's known since his time in St. Petersburg, a man called Dmitry Medvedev. What does Medvedev announce when he becomes president? Who's my prime minister going to be? Ah, Vladimir V. Putin will become my prime minister. And of course, everyone laughs about it. It's so obvious that although Medvedev has the keys to the car, the bloke in the back seat with the steering wheel is, of course, Putin. He's real liberal and he had a good education, uh, good knowledge. In, uh, he's planning to the democratic processes in Russia. In this case, maybe you're right. I mean, they're more liberal than uh, Mr. Putin. Putin and Medvedev are pretty inseparable. They're kind of the same packet, really, aren't they? <laughs> and, and no comments. <laughs> okay. The Russian people are completely aware of the fact that, that, that Putin is, is the backseat driver of the Medvedev presidency. Uh, everybody knows it. it, it, it it's the, the butt of jokes and satire. It, in a time when still in Russia, you could laugh at Putin. Now it's a little bit harder. It's very ingenious, actually, because the outside world and, in fact, the Russian liberal, the sort of liberal elements within Russia have been getting a bit suspicious of Putin at this point. And this enables him to kind of postpone things. And so he, he gets Medvedev elected as president, and Medvedev puts forward this, this, uh, this image that he's going to be more liberal, he's, he's interested in tackling corruption, he's interested in the rule of law, he's also interested in technological developments and so on. So there's this sort of sense that's created that Russia, you know, it look, looked like things were coming off the rails a bit with things like the Munich speech, but actually now maybe there's an opportunity to pull Russia back. And really this kind of carries on fooling people for, for the next four years. You see this with Putin, that his decision-making becomes more and more concentrated. The people he trusts become fewer and fewer. And when your decision-making becomes that concentrated, you are getting less information in. You're also being told increasingly what you want to hear rather than what is the truth. And the consequences of your decisions become more and more catastrophic when they're wrong. Historically, in Russia and in the Soviet Union, bringing bad news tends to, be, tends to mean shooting the messenger. You're becoming an increasingly an irrational, irrational actor, which is ironic for someone who has always been so ruthless in pursuing power. But actually, having a lot of sources for you to, to make decisions is useful, and he's losing that. Putin is somewhat atypical of dictators in the sense that many dictators seize power quite forcibly, or if they use the democratic process, you know, everyone knows that, you know, they fudged it. So who are you kidding, Mr. Dictator? We know that election you know, wasn't fair. If Putin had just served two terms and left in 2007, 2008, most people would have thought he was a great Russian leader. Yeah, he had some problems, but, you know, ultimately they would have thought that he probably won those elections fair and square. He was a democratically elected strongman. <laughs> so I think that, you know, his dictatorship is something that's kind of emerged and grown organically. I don't, I don't necessarily think that Putin's plan, you know, on day one is, right, I'm going to become a dictator. I don't think it was that. I think his narcissism and his desire to hold on to power and, and, and his anger at some issues have emboldened him to take more and more power.
Patience plays an absolutely key role uh, in any dictator's armory, if you like. They, they've got to play the long game if they want to stay in power. And often dictators are saying to their people, um, you know, the point about me being dictator is I'm going to make this country great again. Um, and, and I'm going to make this country and its empire, perhaps, last for a thousand years. You know, Hitler, I'm going to have a thousand year Reich. Putin, I'm going to make Russia great again. I'm, I'm going to claw back some of the territories we lost. You've got to play the long game. You know, it's not like in a democratic cycle, typically four or five years, you know, you're looking to that next election. Putin doesn't really have to worry about elections anymore. He's now worried, you know, about his long-term legacy and not whether he's going to get back in at the next election. There's no doubt that when Putin, you know, runs for president again after he's been prime minister, that, you know, there are people, you know, wanting to stand against him. And those who stand against him find that, you know, that they can't get permission for their planes to take off or where they're going to give a meeting, the water pipe has conveniently burst an hour before, or wherever they're trying to take their supporters out to eat, there are no waiters for some reason. You know, it, it, you know it's, it's dirty ops, nasty, you know, dirty tricks being played on all the opponents. After the financial crisis in 2008, when the economy stops growing and people's standards of living really stop improving, and even more so in the recent period with the effects of the pandemic and so forth, where, where people's living standards have really taken a hit, you've got to find some kind of a new source of legitimacy. And that new source is, we are unsafe, there are enemies at our doorstep, or even inside our country, there are fifth columnists inside our country who are traitors who are trying to destroy us. And so you need me. I am, as it were, the biggest dog in the pack. I am the person who can take our enemies down and keep the people safe. Everybody said, don't get involved in a civil war, and he got involved in a civil war and managed to keep his man in charge. But the other important thing I think about the intervention in Syria is it's part of this project to reassert Russia as a great power, because really what he's saying is, there are these various problems in the Middle East, and you, the outside world, cannot solve the problems in the Middle East without me. It's that exertion of Russia's power as a military force. And so it, it's part of this sort of ongoing campaign to be taken seriously. You know, I need to be at the top table. It's not up to the United States to impose the world order that it wants. And I think that's fundamentally the message that he sent through the intervention in Syria. There's a kind of general point that, that Putin's willingness to ally with a regime that's perfectly prepared to use chlorine, gas or sarin or whatever on its own population is just an illustration that Putin doesn't care about the lives of ordinary people. What Putin cares about is power politics and geopolitics. It may or may not be coincidence that that happened in 2013 and a year later Putin, you know, invaded Crimea and, and Donbass. I don't think anything is ever as simple as that, but yes, I would, I would say that the moment that chemical attack is left unchallenged, Putin will think, okay, if they won't challenge me in Syria, 
which is in many ways a proxy war. They certainly won't challenge me in Crimea and Donbass, which I regard as my backyard. And he, and he was right. Um, the flip side, of course, is at what point do you challenge and risk escalation? You know, people, at what point should we have challenged him over Litvinenko? At what point should we have challenged him over Sergei Skripal? You could sit there and say, we won't have these things happen on our soil. But the alternative is that you react in a way that many people see as overreaction. I would go even further back than, than Syria. When the Second Chechen War was happening with huge amount of civilian casualties and all human rights organizations, including Russian ones and the Western ones, they were shouting, screaming, saying that, look, this is huge crisis. This is a crime against humanity. None of the Western governments seriously criticise Putin. Not enough people looked at the Chechen war and realised quite how brutal and horrible that was. How, you know, the, the, the death and destruction that went on was, 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 was barbaric and horrific, and it was ordered by Putin. They thought Putin's fight was similar to uh, War on Terror, uh, initiated by the United States around the same time, because Putin was very clever. Uh, because Chechens were Muslim nation, he presented that fight as a, a fight against Islamic terrorism. You only have to look at the Chechen war and then how Putin has prosecuted the war in Syria to realise that you know the longer the war in Ukraine goes on, the more it's going to get like Chechnya, the more cities in Ukraine are going to look like Aleppo in Syria, i.e. no longer existing. I mean, this is the thing, no one really knows why now. As in, he could have done it at any time in the last eight years. Uh, you know, the invasion of, of, of Crimea and, and Donbass in 2014. I mean, this is the thing that the conflict has been going on in Ukraine for, for eight years now. As to why he's done it now, I mean, he did it obviously in the winter because it's technically easier to go over frozen ground than it would be in the summer, although not that you necessarily know it by the, by the losses the Russian army have taken. There's lots of speculation about the state of his health, about you know, his own personal reasons for doing it. Again, no one really knows, and it's very tempting for people to look at pictures of his puffy face and go, oh, he must be, you know, have terminal cancer or whatever. <laughs> Who knows? It's, you know, it, it's tempting to think of him as this, you know, th this sort of mix of Howard Hughes and Hitler in downfall, sort of pacing vast Black Sea mansions, isolated, paranoid about COVID. I think it's, it's, it's all of a piece with, with his world view. Putin defines as success, strength, anything that's revealed him to be strong, anything that's made his opponent look weak. So, you know, when he goes into these other countries and they do nothing, like going to Crimea in 2014 and stealing that off Ukraine, that was a huge success. You know, he, he, he's a gambler, he's reckless. He's like a person who drives through a red light at 100 miles an hour, and if he hasn't had a crash, he says that's been a successful maneuver. Well, you know, most people regard that as not a particularly successful thing to have done. You know, you've always killed yourself and other people doing it, but, you know, that's fine by him. Physically, Vladimir Putin is a very slight and small man. As a child, he wasn't, you know, the pick of the bunch. One might even almost call him, like, the runt of the litter. And there's this story that Putin always tells, which, you know, as a kind of warning to the rest of the world, that once when he was a little boy, he was chasing a rat 
around the apartment blocks, the very shabby apartment blocks where he lived. And, and as he was chasing this rat, he, he cornered the rat. The rat looks at Putin, Putin looks at the rat, and Putin runs away. Putin tells this story to other politicians and world leaders and says, look, if you put someone in a corner, their only option is to fight back as viciously as possible. You know, that's a kind of warning to people, you know, don't corner me, because if you corner me, I'm going to be like that rat, and you're going to be like the little Putin. So, you know, this is this kind of metaphorical story that Putin loves telling. I think what this story also illustrates is that he was the type of young boy who would run away from a rat. What's clear is that some political murders in the Putin period are absolutely inconceivable that they've been carried out without Putin's say-so. For example, the poisoning of Alexander Litvinenko, the former KGB agent in London, Litvinenko has poison put in his tea, dies of radiation poisoning. Absolutely inconceivable that that wasn't done without the direct orders of Putin. That was certainly the clear conclusion of the Litvinenko inquiry. Similarly with the Skripal poisoning, the attempted murder of the former KGB agent Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia in Salisbury. The Salisbury poisonings aren't unique, but they're very rare. They were certainly a shock to those of us who live just outside Salisbury. You know, uh, the idea that, that my child could have discovered that vial of Novichok rather than poor old Dawn Sturgis, who did and died as a result. So I, I think that they are a absolutely despicable and vile way of trying to uh, project state power, which is exactly what Putin was doing. And it's a way of saying that, you know, never be a traitor to me, because you're always going to end up badly. Poisoning someone is actually hard to do. And it's, it's sort of, they do it because they can and because it sends a message. Poison is, is difficult, it's tricky, it's dangerous to the, to the people doing it. It's a, it's a peculiarly Russian thing to do. It's just, it's, it's unnecessarily brutal. Some are done not on his direct orders, but in his interests. So the best example of that would be the journalist Anna Politkovskaya, who's killed in 2006. Politkovskaya has been a very critical voice, writing about the horrors of the Second Chechen War. She's one of the few journalists who's writing about things like the Russian internment camps, where they would round up Chechen men and boys, and basically the, the people in the internment camps would then be found dead, thrown into ditches. You know, these are the kind of reports that, that Politkovskaya is writing. So she shot in her apartment block on Putin's birthday. This is a great mafia tradition in Russia. Like it's the birthday present to the boss. This idea of, of ordering things by implication, you know, the analogy is it's a bit like when, as a child, you decide to be good for some reason, you think, I'm going to tidy up my bedroom because I think my mum and dad will like it. They haven't told you to tidy your bedroom, but you do it because you know they're going to like it. And it's that kind of childish relationship that people have with dictators, which means that sometimes dictators never have to order anything because everybody below them knows what you want. Nemtsov is an interesting case because Nemtsov was... Nemtsov was probably the one leader who could have been the guy the West could have dealt with. He was the wrong side of, the, of when the musical chair stopped. And after that, you know, he's an incredibly able, um, intelligent, charismatic, you know, tall, handsome. I mean, so, you know, I mean, quite a rock star, certainly by political terms. And then he became an opposition politician, an economic advisor to the Ukrainian government for a while. <laughs> He was preparing a report on Russian involvement in Ukraine. This is after the first the invasion in 2014. 
and he was shot and killed. And he was shot on that bridge just south of the Kremlin. Nothing happens on that bridge without the Kremlin knowing. I mean, it's one of the, it's one of the most heavily guarded and most easily surveyed places in all of Russia, as you'd expect from somewhere so close to the Kremlin. All the cameras were off for maintenance. There was one camera, which was a TV company's camera, you know, 200 meters away. There was a street cleaning vehicle that stopped just at the right place. I mean, this, this is, you know, this is proper, proper FSB operation. I mean, it, you know, it, this is very well done. And Putin had this big thing that, oh, you know, we're going to find out who did it. And, a, you know, a variety of Chechens were blamed. But that's what happens in Russia. If you're any kind of threat, you get, you get jailed like Khodorkovsky, you get poisoned like Navalny, or you get shot like Nemtsov. That's the way they do things. That's the way they've always, they've always done things. You have some dictators who basically regularly organise bloodbaths. I mean, Saddam Hussein was constantly knocking off his opponents. The Putin way is not to organise a bloodbath of, you know, those around him or family members. It, it, it's, it's to organise bloodbaths of people who've, who've turned against him as a public show of, you know, don't mess me around because you're going to end up either shot on a bridge outside the Kremlin, poisoned in a street in Salisbury, or, or irradiated in a restaurant in London. There's three ways that he might go, um, assuming that he doesn't either die or um, hand over power voluntarily. Um, and at the moment, they're all pretty unlikely. The first is some kind of Western operation, either a special forces operation or a missile strike, neither of which are going to happen. I mean, the, 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 he's so well guarded that even the best Western special forces in the world are not going to be able to A, find, a, find him or B, actually do something about it. The second is, is a palace coup, is someone from the inside. And there's a lot of talk about the oligarchs getting together and, and somehow forcing Putin out. That's not plausible either. Putin keeps the oligarchs at arm's length. The only people he really trusts are what uh, are called the Siloviki, the enforcers. They are his old guys, you know, his old friends from um, the Leningrad KGB. It's a very small circle who have access to him, probably less than 10, um, who have genuine unfettered access to him. The problem with that is that their fortunes are tied to his. And yes, there's a, there's a stage, a foreseeable stage, where things get so bad that they could move against him. But it would need to be so bad that they would all move against him, because no one's going to be the first to put their head above the parapet. If you're a Tory MP and you want to, to get rid of Boris Johnson, you send a letter to Graham Brady of the 1922 committee saying, I'd like a leadership election. If you're the first guy who does that in, in the Kremlin, you're taken outside and shot, because someone's going to betray you to Putin. They, they are his underlings, but they're also rivals for his, his ear, his attention, his affection, and so on. And the third is a popular uprising. There was some research from a Harvard political scientist a few years ago that suggested, suggested that you only need 3.5% of a population to be really committed to change and, and active in doing so to get regime change. 3.5% of Russia's population would be about 5 million people, which is round about the population of St. Petersburg, around about half the population of Moscow. But again, that's so hard to imagine right now because, you know, you can be in prison for 15 years for using the word war, you know, let alone going out on the streets to protest. So there, you know, there is, and there is a there is a plausible tipping point if things get bad enough, but I think that's quite a long way down the line. It's not obvious how the Russian people would be in a position to get rid of Putin. I mean, I suppose in general, the, the, the uh, <laughs> if you've got rulers that you don't like and you can't get rid of them through elections, then your your only alternative is mass protest, you know, revolution. But it's very difficult to start a revolution in a police state. 
it's far too risky, it's far too personally dangerous. It's not just personally dangerous, it's, it's if, you, if, you, if you're a political opposition in a police state, that's a danger to everyone you know, it's a danger to your friends, it's a danger to your family. Their only alternatives, if they don't like what's going on, is to leave the country. And I think it's no coincidence that the one human right that Putin has left alone is freedom of movement. There's been an enormous out-migration of the Russian middle classes. You don't have to purge your opposition, you can just send them into exile. He had all the conditions. He had a huge country with amazing level of resources. It's not only oil and gas. Almost everything else you need, any kind of mineral, you can find under Russian soil. And the, geographically, this huge land has huge potential large number of, of people. So by considering all this as an investment and building on top of this, he could have become a very successful leader, very, very, very popular leader for Russian people. But this wasn't enough for him. He, was, he doesn't want to focus internally. He wants to make Russia a great nation, just like uh, in the times of the Russian uh, Tsarist Empire. And he wants to be the leader of this greater Russia. And that will be, I think this is his vulnerability. And if the Ukrainian situation, one way or another, kept under control with some kind of a ceasefire and then peace, and maybe the conflict will continue for a while, but at a lower scale, I don't think that will be enough for him. Uh, I'm sure he will, he will find something else next uh, to continue after that uh, vague goal of greatness. Putin's Achilles heel is his own ambition. I think he's overreached himself. I think that he is attempting now to do things that actually he doesn't have the manpower or materiel or, or ultimately the support to do it. I think, I think that's his problem. He's been in power for too long, that paranoiac, narcissistic, mentality has now completely in control of him and he's no longer you know he's not mad but he's he's no longer got that perspective that he needs all of the economic progress that russia's made in the 22 years before that decision is just frittered away if his end game is to make russia as big and as powerful as the soviet union he's still got a very long way to go and he's going to have a hell of a fight because I don't think that the free world is really going to stand for it. I don't think the people of all the countries that Putin wants to have back under Russia's control are going to stand for it. If his end game, I think, with Ukraine is to conquer the whole of Ukraine, I think he's a long way from that. If his end game is to find a kind of off ramp uh, and, and something that's going to give him a bit of territory or a bit of say so in what's going to happen in Ukraine in decades to come or years to come, then he may be near to that. It's hard to see how in the long run he's able to actually maintain his position there's been a sort of deal with the insiders in the kremlin in the Putin presidency which is do what i want and you are free to steal at will and live the kind of lifestyle that you never imagined that deal has been completely broken. So what's their motivation to continue to support him? Well, in the short run, Russian patriotism. We're uh, restoring our imperial greatness. But if that fails, what's left? Putin's legacy will undoubtedly be one of the most hated and reviled and evil men who's ever lived on this planet. Whoever replaces Putin, I, I, I will bet quite a lot of money on it most of us won't have heard of him, or perhaps her. The problem with getting rid of Putin, you know, that's one thing, but who's gonna replace him? And could the replacement be worse? Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss 
any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.